Jesus promised to send him some most precious gift after his glorification. He said in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. See, the Comforter was to be sent after the glorification of Jesus. And uh, in John 14, 26, we read the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. In verse 16 and 17 of John 14, Jesus said, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Now Jesus, when speaking of the Comforter, he said, He dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Here we find what almost seems like a contradiction, since we just read in John 16 that the Comforter could not be sent until Jesus Christ was glorified. The Comforter's coming was dependent on Jesus going away and his glorification. So how is it that the Comforter, who was yet to be sent in John 16, was dwelling with them in John 14? This passage explains itself. Jesus didn't leave off in verse 17. He continues in the next verse. Here's what he says in verse 18. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. You see, Christ was the one that was dwelling with them. And he was the one that was going to be in them. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ is the comforter himself. The Greek word for comforter in this verse is parakletos. John uses this word five times in scripture. The fifth time it is used is in 1 John 2.1 where it is translated as the advocate. I'm going to read 1 John 2, 1. He says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now E.J. Wagner quoted this verse from the RV. He wrote concerning this in his book, The Everlasting Covenant. And uh, when he wrote, he used the margin. And here's what Wagner said when he quoted from this Bible. He said, Jesus is the comforter. If any man sin, we have a comforter with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And that's what 1 John 2, 1 is telling us. The parakletos, the comforter, the advocate, is Jesus Christ. He is the comforter. Now, some, is gonna, some people will object because Christ said another. Doesn't that indicate he's speaking of someone else is, is often the question. Now, it would be odd that this question would come up after what we just read about Jesus Christ dwelling with them and he would be in them. It's not somebody else. It was Jesus Christ himself. But let's look more at the word another in this verse. This, the same Greek word for another is used of Saul in the Greek Old Testament. And let's notice what it says in 1 Samuel 10.6. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. Saul was about to be turned into another man. Now Saul had been through an experience. He had received the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ was, was uh, about to go through an experience. Saul was turned into another man in the same way Jesus was another comforter. The term another in this passage means, it means another of the same. Saul was still Saul after the experience, yet he was different. He was another of the same. And he was another man. And the same thing with Jesus Christ. He had been through an experience. He had been glorified. And after his experience of going through the crucifixion, being tempted like you and me, he was turned into another comforter. He had been through an experience, another of the same. Jesus was the one who was dwelling with them and would be in them. He was the one who would not leave them comfortless, but would come unto them. If we keep reading in John 14, it becomes even more clear. But so many people stop at verse 17. Let's look at verse 19 and 20 as well. It says, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. Remember, the world doesn't know him, the comforter. In verse 17, that's what it said. But you see me, because I live, you shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Again, Christ in you, the Comforter. He's the Holy Spirit. Remember in verse 17 we read regarding the Comforter, the world cannot receive him because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. 
The world cannot see him, but you see him. In verse 19, he is the one who is being seen. And in verse 18, he is the one who said, I will not leave you comfortless. And in verse 20, he says, I in you, again. Now, the, the, the Bible tells us in Colossians 1.27, it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the devil has been seeking to take away the hope of glory of many in our churches today. Sister Ellen White once wrote regarding the Comforter in uh, the Review and Herald, August 26, 1890. She said, the reason why the churches are weak and sickly and ready to die is that the enemy has brought influences of a discouraging nature to bear upon trembling souls. He has sought to shut Jesus from their view as the Comforter, as one who reproves, who warns, who admonishes them, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. See, Satan is trying to shut Jesus from our view as the comforter. There's only one. He is the comforter. He has kept us from seeing this marvelous truth that we have a comforter in us who has been tempted just like us, who can truly say, I have been through what you are going through. Let's read Hebrews 2.18. It says, For in, he, in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. He's able to secure us or... In other words, he's able to help us. He's able to comfort us. He's been through it. He can help you. He is your comforter. Now, that's, that's why the churches are weak and sick and ready to die, is because they don't know that Jesus is the comforter. Jesus told the disciples that he would come back to them and he would manifest himself to them. This was a special promise. This was the promise of the Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit. The disciples did not understand how it was that Christ would manifest himself to them spiritually. They, they couldn't figure this out. But Jesus told his disciples that it would not only be him coming to them, but also his Father. And this would truly be a comfort to, to us, but it's a spiritual manifestation. Here's what, here's what uh, Judas said to Jesus in verse 22. Judas said unto him, not Iscariot. Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Remember, the world doesn't know him. The world doesn't see him. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, Sister Ellen White once said, There is no comforter like Christ, so tender and so true. He is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. His Spirit speaks to the heart. The influence of the Holy Spirit is the life of Christ in the soul. It's His life in our soul. That's what the Spirit is. And there is no comforter like Christ. There, there is no one who's been touched with the feeling of our infirmities. No one who's been through it like He has. And that's why there is no comforter like Christ. He is the comforter. And His Holy Spirit is our, His life in the soul, His mind, His character. Now, some have thought that the Spirit was a separate and distinct being from Him, but clearly it is not. It's His life. When, when we meet God face to face, He's not going to say to us, meet my Spirit, He's standing over there. If we look at the sanctuary, we see God and we see His Son. And we're going to take a look at the, a couple of verses here just to see this. The Father is the source of that Spirit that flows through His Son, Jesus Christ, out to all of us. When we look at the sanctuary in heaven, we can see this. And we also see what, the, what comes from this source. It's a, it's a river of living water. Revelation 22, verse 1, it says, And he showed me a pure river of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Here we have God. That's the Father. And we have the Lamb. That's the Son of God. And finally, we have a river of life. That's the Holy Spirit. We have one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. And by Him comes the Holy Spirit, through Him. So that river of living water flows from the source. Let's look at John 7, 38 and 39. It says, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Remember, the Spirit was not to be given till he was glorified, but yet he was dwelling with them. 
in John CSF 14, the comforter was with them. That living water that flows from the throne of God is the Spirit. It flows through His Son, Jesus Christ, and out through all the children of God. And it flows out of their bodies like living water. As Jesus said, it, it will proceed out of you. And, and that source, of course, is the Father. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, including the Holy Spirit, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. And that includes the Holy Spirit again. All things proceed from our one God, the Father, and come by his Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul said, we have one Lord. In Ephesians 4, 5. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 tells us, the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom, freedom from sin. Christ is that spirit and he has come to deliver the captives and to give them liberty and freedom from the bondage and captivity of sin. And to Laodicea, he stands at the door and knocks. He's knocking on the door of the heart. But they're letting someone else in. They won't let Christ in. They think the comforter is somebody else. 